Um, to me, Dave is a kind of real, live Superman. He does something, he's going to tell you about what he does and what his life is about, something that to me is absolutely astonishing and I'm super envious whenever he shows footage of his work, I just go, oh, I wish I could do that. Um, curiosity is super important for all of us, but Dave uh, emphasized that to me on the phone recently. He said, you know, curiosity really drives my work and I think it's the most important thing for science, for engineers, and for life. And certainly in this room, we have seen a lot of that over the last couple of days. And, um, you're about to get a dose of unbelievable, satisfying curiosity and science from Dave Gallo. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, so, I don't, I'm not quite a superman. Uh, in fact, I feel, I'm really humbled being here. I was a really bad student. I'm not going to hide that from you. And uh, I had a, a lot of trouble getting through school. In fact, I didn't know that I was going to get through eighth grade into high school. I didn't know whether I was going to get out of high school into college. And uh, there, even though, you know, it's funny, I always wanted to be a scientist, but my grades were really bad. Um, my uh, standard test scores were horrible. And so my guidance counselor said, forget it, you know. And, and, uh, and that, that was tough because what it did was strip away my pride and my confidence. And so after school, I tried community college for a little bit after I got out of high school, and I flunked out, dropped out, um, and that really did a lot even more to push my confidence down. Uh, so I sold shoes for about seven years, which was great. I was having a great time, and one day I was flipping through a National Geographic magazine, and there was an article in there. I was in my mid-20s by then. And the article was about exploring the deep ocean. And there was one picture that was drawn by hand. It was about a mountain at the bottom of the sea, and about exploring that mountain in a little tiny submarine. And there's something about that image that just flipped something in my mind that got my curiosity going. The first couple of people I met were encouraging because I said, you know, how, this is amazing. They said, you ought to check it out. You ought to do it. And uh, it was two years later, so I went back to school. Two years later, I was in that sub, my first dive to the bottom of the ocean, and then got, eventually got a, a, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and then finally a PhD. I, ha I have ADD. I was born with ADD. I have also got a nonverbal learning disability, which makes it really tough for me to read. So a book, you know, I get really envious when I see people uh, reading a book and enjoying a book because it's tough. I, and and I, I managed to cope because to get my degrees because of my curiosity. It was more important uh, to me that I found ways. I had to work a lot harder, but, but I got through it. And, and Eric's right, you know, the curiosity, how important that is. If you can latch on to your passion, if you can hook into your curiosity, uh, it, it drives, it makes you work harder than you can ever imagine working. And I come from a place, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, we've got a thousand people, everyone there are curious about the ocean. So what I'm hoping today in this challenge, I want to expose you to some things, just like that one picture triggered something in me, because I didn't get smarter, I just got driven. And I'm hoping that something I show you today does the same thing with you, that you go, wow, I had no idea, and I want to pursue that. And you know, it all starts with that, our good old planet Earth home. And uh, think about this, how much we take that for granted, that, that image of home. And uh, it took a lot to get that image. And as a species, we have no right to go out into space and turn around and look back at Earth. But we take it for granted. You know, actually, it's funny, because my neighbor, uh, Sunita Williams was the commander of the space station for a few months last summer. And, you know, I just see Sunita all the time. I take it for granted that this is a, a woman that's been up in space and looked down on this planet. And that's a big mistake, because when we start to take this for granted, we start to think we know it all, and we don't know it all. In fact, we don't know most about it, because most of the Earth looks like that. That's the same Earth, we just take the clouds away, spin it around, and we're looking at the Earth from the Pacific Ocean, and you hardly see any continent on there at all. It's all blue, the blue planet. Average depth of the water is about two miles. And back when I got into this world, we had explored about 5% of that blue. It covers 70% of the Earth. We covered 5% of it, we've explored 5%. That means 95% of that ocean, most of this planet, is unexplored. We haven't even got the foggiest idea what's out there. And how can that be when this is our home? You know, we deserve it, we owe it to ourselves to understand what, what happens out there beneath those waves. 
And you know, most people think about the ocean like this, you know, it's the beach. And we're a long way from the beach here in Denver. And when I grew up in central New York, I was a long way from the beach too. Uh, but that's not the ocean. And, and when you think about what, beyond the beach, what's over the horizon, we used to make it look like this, where we drew maps of the, of the uh, earth, of the oceans. We put monsters out there, you know. And I love that one up in, the, up in the top left where there's this giant thing coming out with water spouting out of its head with giant fangs bigger than the boat, and some guy's got a gun, and he's going to take a shot at this thing. Um, so we used to put monsters out there, and even today we, we make monsters where there are really none, sharks, you know. Uh, sharks, uh, this is a smiling, happy shark. Uh, and if you're in the water with them, then you hope he's smiley, happy, and not hungry, too, because they are vicious predators, but also incredibly important to life on this planet, yet we kill millions of sharks every year for shark fin soup. We kill millions of these animals every single year. Um, beyond, you know, there's plenty of things beneath the sea, and these are the things that got me excited you know, back in 1976 it was, there's mountains beneath the sea. I call them the moonless mountains. Uh, this one's called the Mid-Ocean Ridge, and it's, uh, it actually goes around the whole planet. You can see it there going around the whole planet. In the middle of the ocean, there's a mountain range. And there's thousands of peaks on that mountain range, many times higher than the peaks in the Rockies. Okay, 50,000 miles long, that pretty much dwarfs the Rockies. There's many, many, many valley, valleys, thousands of times, thousands of them that are many times wider and deeper than the Grand Canyon. There's underwater rivers, there's underwater lakes, there's underwater waterfalls. It's the most bizarre world you can ever imagine, yet it does exist out there in our own planet beneath the sea, it's beneath the waves. We don't think about it, we don't talk about it much, but it turns out that it's incredibly important. Um, the normal way we explore, one of the most romantic ways, is by submarine. So two miles deep, so this is a submarine Elvin that Woods Hole Oceanographic, my institution, operates. And it's great because three people, you put three of you in this little tiny sphere. It's not much wider across than the tables you're sitting at, so you're pretty much on top of one another. And then you're surrounded by equipment, too. And then this is a launch on deck. 50 people on the ship making sure you're safe. But right then, very important question everybody asks inside that submarine, should I have gone to the bathroom one more time? because it's a 10-hour it's a day. And over the side you go, and when you hit the water right there, everything changes. You know, that blue penetrates your spirit. You don't hear the surface ship anymore. You hear the sound of the sonar pinging down to the bottom and then coming back up again, that ping sound. If there's whales, you can hear the whales. You might see fish outside. And a diver checks out, make sure, make, making sure all the scientific gear is on the sub okay, and you begin the dive. Two and a half hours, down you go, and you float through the water. And after the first half hour, that lovely blue goes to deep blue, dark blue, and then pitch black for two hours of that dive, pitch black. And you know, we were sure, because it was pitch black, there'd be no life there. And then when we look, we say, whoa, you know, check this out. There's all sorts of life, and it's all sorts of bizarre life. This is a jellyfish, uh, but it's got all sorts of working parts. It's got tentacles, it's got little fishing lures, it's got individual stomachs, and full grown, that jellyfish would be over 100 feet long. It just keep add, it keeps adding segments. These animals turn out to be incredibly important. Not only are they cool to look at, but they're really important for what they eat, what eats them, and the, the kinds of things they do uh, with the ocean waters and gases in the ocean waters. So that one looks like it's from space. You know, every dive we go on, turn the cameras on, we find more animals like that. Keep going down to the bottom, and on top of that mountain range, it's all volcanic. So where there's volcanic um, mountains, we get lava. Where there's lava, you get hot water heated up. That, that's water you see coming out of the earth like a hot spring. It's about 700 degrees Fahrenheit. So we were positive there would be no life down there. It's too deep, it's too dark, the pressure's incredible. Uh, the water's poisonous, it would kill all of us in this room just like that. And so there was no reason to look for life. And then one day, some scientists stumbling around in the submarine, driving around the bottom at a half mile an hour, look off into the distance. And what comes into to vision after a while is life at the bottom of the sea on top of that mountain range where we said there should be no life at all. You're going to see it here in a minute. There's life down there. In fact, there's more life down there along those mountain ranges than there is in the tropical rainforest. And all these animals are really bizarre. They're like alien life living on our own planet because they're not living off sunlight. It's not plants and these animals. These animals are living off that poison, that's the, the fluids that are poisonous to us. 
So these, the white things with the red tips are called tube worms. There's crabs, there's clams, there's shrimp. Uh, in one spot, there were 300 species of animals and 297 of them we've never seen before, so brand new species of life. You're gonna see that crab there on the lower right try to grab a tube worm. And you know, we're just beginning to understand what these places mean to us. There's all sorts of implications for biotechnology and things like that. So we were dead wrong about life on Earth, and it wasn't anything that was predicted. That's the important point. It was all about exploration, curiosity, and then understanding. Also on the bottom are pieces of human history, and this is Titanic. And in 2010, I co-led an expedition to Titanic. This is the bow, so we're looking at the bow of Titanic. And that's where Jack was king of the world in the movie. And, you know, Jim Cameron, the guy that produced the movie, one of, and, and Avatar, he's a fanatic deep sea explorer. And he just made the deepest dive into the Mariana Trench in his own submarine that he built. So we learn a lot from Titanic, and one of the things we learn is something about human uh, pride and hubris and uh, arrogance, because Titanic you know, there it is at the bottom. It was supposed to be the unsinkable ship, and we plowed through the night without thinking about all the uh, consequences of what if we hit an iceberg, and there Titanic sits on the bottom. The other thing was, when Titanic sank, we, we, we cast the ship and the souls aboard for eternity to the deep, for eternity to the deep, and there we are. All of a sudden, there we are in a submarine. Is this eternity? You know, so every time we go to Titanic, we go with an awful lot of respect. There's a lot more lessons Titanic has to offer that we'll be exploring in the coming years ahead. So there's so much to explore at the bottom of the ocean. It's not all deep water. This is only, the Titanic's about two miles deep. There's stuff that happens three, four, five miles deep, seven miles deep. This is about a mile deep. I see that's a puddle of water that you're looking at right there. And actually beneath the sea, and I said it earlier, there are lakes beneath the sea. That's, that water that you see right there is at the bottom of the ocean. So you get in your submarine, you go down to the bottom of the ocean, there's the seafloor, and you go across the seafloor, and all of a sudden you see a lake, a shoreline, with animals living along the shoreline, and then water on the bottom of the ocean. So I said there's lakes, rivers, waterfalls, all at the bottom of the sea. And you know, it's, I'm spitting out all this stuff because, and we don't know a lot about it. We haven't had time to look at all these places. So we're just now getting, as I said, we knew 5% we explored, now we're up to 7%. So that's like 93% of the ocean yet to be explored full of stuff like this. Even in shallow water. Now my friend Roger Hanlon, he studies cephalopods. It's like octopuses, squid, um, and things like that, cuttlefish. And this one image, this one clip that he's got here, a hiding octopus. It just shows you how amazing some life can be at the bottom of the sea. So here he comes up to this algae, and boom, there's an octopus. Yeah, that's his eye right there, staring at you. And off he goes, puts up a cloud of ink, octopus scoots away, and Roger's paddling really fast behind to catch up to the squid, the octopus. And then he tries to bluff by making his body really big. You know, uh, very intelligent animals, but now we're gonna do this backwards. And it's hard to believe that that animal on the right can turn into that stuff on the left. And the way that it does it is does it by changing the color and texture of its skin. You can't believe that it's possible. Watch this, the one, two, three, and gone. And, all pretty, and that's slow motion, that's in slow motion. And really it does it that quick. Imagine the brain, what's the brain doing that operates that? It's gotta know what do I look like to you so I can hide against in that background. So the bottom of the ocean in terms of the, ex the fun of exploration, the joy of discovery, the curiosity, awesome, awesome, and waiting to be discovered. But there's another part of it, the important part. On a planet that's mostly covered with unexplored ocean, We've got seven billion people, that's where we live. And no matter where you live, whether it's LA or Denver or Cape Cod where I live, or the heartland of Africa or China, the oceans impact your everyday life and no matter where you live, you impact the oceans. You know, what you put on the ground here in Denver or into the air eventually makes its way to the sea. The most important thing though, so there's that connection, okay? The oceans reach out, climate, this uh, beautiful blue skies you have here, or storms that you get here in Denver, the water that you get here in Denver, comes, starts way out in the Pacific Ocean. So there's a link that we don't think about because we haven't known much about it, but the link is there. And in fact, the oceans today, here's the headlines. The air you breathe, every other breath of fresh air you take, you can thank the ocean for half of that. I mean, half of the air you breathe is from the ocean, 50%. 
The water you drink, the water right here on your tables, about 80% of the water that you have to drink comes out of the ocean. And it depends on patterns inside the ocean. The food you eat, there's a billion and a half people on this planet uh, that depend on the oceans for food. So the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, all those things having to do with the oceans that we are impacting every single day and yet we haven't even understood it. We haven't even begun to explore it. That's stupid. And that's really dumb. And in fact, the thing that gets me today, uh, you know, you can't see 7 billion people living on this planet. And, and we're almost like a virus living on Earth, uh, but we're there, 7 billion people. And just like it was hard to believe that that octopus could turn into that, to that algae, it's hard to believe it, but we've done it. We've changed the chemistry of the ocean. We've changed the temperature of the ocean. So we've had this global impact, uh, just like a virus, we're making the planet sick. And it's not about the controversy of climate change and global warming about that. In this case, it's just pollution, plastics, flame retardants, pharmaceuticals, caffeine, stuff. You'd, if you catch a fish from the middle of the Pacific Ocean and look at the stomach contents, you'll find bits of plastic in there. If you look at the flesh, examine the flesh, you'll find stuff that we think makes our life, everyday life great, like flame retardants. So right now, it's just like we're eating our own garbage. You know, again, we didn't know in the past, now we know. Now it's time to do something about it. But it's tough to get into people's minds, especially if you're in Denver or Kansas, away from the ocean. It's tough enough if you live on the ocean to get that message across. But here we're a long way from the ocean. But it's so important because no matter where you live, that, that controversy exists. There's some, uh, just one view of plastic uh, on the ocean, on the ocean shore. But even in the middle of the ocean, I, on Titanic, I remember walking out on deck one night. We just got to the Titanic site, which is a long way uh, from any place south of Newfoundland, Canada. And the first thing I saw when I looked over the edge of the boat was plastic bags, just plastic. It was disgusting. On the bottom of the ocean, some of our deepest dives, the one thing we see are bits of plastic. I mean, come on. You know, it's, again, in the past we didn't know. Now we know. Now it's time to do something about it. Um, I don't know if you can see that too well, but at, at nighttime, during the daytime, you can't see us. At night, the Earth lights up, and I'll zoom in here a little bit. There's North America. You can make that out. Um, next is uh, Europe. Again, you can, those are the lights of people at night, and the white lights are the electric world. Up in the right-hand corner, those reddish-pinkish lights, those are gas flares from oil exploration. Um, the blue, that's the Sea of Japan. The blue, all those blue clouds you see there, those are fishing boats. We've managed to kill a lot of the fish inside the sea uh, by overfishing and not managing our fisheries. You know, it's almost like we waged war on life in the sea. We're changing the temperature, we're changing the chemistry, and on top of that, we're catching fish in record numbers. And fisheries are collapsing. And again, silliness, not a good way to live on a planet. Not if we want the planet to take care of us. There's a term we like, if we kill the oceans, we kill ourselves, and we're on our way of doing that, on the way to doing that. Um, this is the image that gets to me most. This is Africa. And you see all those golden dots. You don't see a lot of white lights from electricity. You don't see uh, much of anything but the golden dots. Those are village fires burning. And uh, it's, it's, it's communities using solids, burning solids for food, uh, for heat, uh, for light at nighttime. And in that part of the world, from there on up to the upper right, through the Middle East, up into Asia, there's about two billion people that are desperate for something you've got right on your table in front of you, which is fresh water. So they're desperate for fresh water. We're, it's a water-starved planet. But you say, well, Dave, how can it be? Uh, you said it's the ocean planet, covered 70%, and yet you're, now you're saying it's water-starved? Well, we took all the water off the Earth to find out how much there really is on the planet, and that's it. The big ball on the right, the blue ball, is all the water on Earth. So you take all the water on Earth, make it into a ball, put it next to the Earth. That's all the water. That little speck to the right of that is all the fresh water. That's it for the whole planet. Well, the oceans, I said, were two miles deep, but they're thousands of miles across. So think of the layer that's two miles deep, but 5,000 across, or two miles deep and 10,000 across, in the case of the Pacific. When you take all that water together, there's not a lot of water on this Earth. And where it rains and where it doesn't rain, you know, that water's got to end up in just the right places, in just the right amounts, at just the right time of year, or societies get really unstable. And that causes a lot of trouble and a lot of hardship, a lot of suffering. It's happening to now on most of the planet. So um, again there, the ocean plays a huge role in something that impacts people right away. So here's the challenge. 
you know, we take this image for granted, we take the oceans for granted. And we've been saying this now, you've been hearing it through climate change, global warming, you've heard those stories, and they, they just fall dead because people are conflicted. Is it real, is it not real? And that, that argument's probably gonna go on. I can tell you it's real, the earth is changing, climate is changing. There's no doubt in our minds about it as scientists. And you know, we're not environmentalists, we're scientists. We just look at facts, put the facts on the table, but in some cases, the facts do get emotional. When you, when you look at the fish and see plastics in their stomachs, uh, chemicals in their flesh, when you look at bits of plastic on the seafloor, when you look at how little water there really is and the people suffering, it makes us say it's time to really get people to understand that we need to protect the sea. So my challenge is to find a way, science has been unable to do it, to mobilize your community, to educate them, and get them to understand how important protecting the sea really is, that what you do locally here can uh, protect the ocean on a global scale. Thank you very much. Okay. Sure, thanks. As always, you have a few minutes with Dave to ask him uh, questions, and I'm sure if you're sure. anything like me, you have lots of questions. Are you, you going to pick the... You, you want me to do it? Yes, that'd be great. Okay. I'm over here. So just kind of... <laughs> do we have one going? Yes. Yeah. I'll let my mic handlers mostly pick. Hi, my name is Matthew Smiraldi. I go to DC21 High School. <laughs> and I actually plan on becoming an oceanographer or marine biologist in my near future. So Fantastic. this was incredibly inspiring for me. Thank you. But what I wanted to ask you was, can you elaborate a little bit more on what you felt when you were down at the wreckage of the Titanic? Like yep. what kind of motions were going through your head? That's sure. incredible. Yeah, we used, uh, when I went, well, I've been once where we used submarines, but I didn't dive. And then the next one I cold at and we used robots. With robots, you send the robot down and you've got a room. It's like the coolest video game you can imagine. So you've got these super high resolution monitors with, and you put on headsets and you've got a joystick. So the eyes are through the robot, but it's, it's Titanic 24 seven. So for weeks on end, you have Titanic right there. And I could walk out of my stateroom, my, my cabin, and walk 29 steps and I was looking at Titanic and it was awesome because you get excited about certain things, um, you know, looking at the bridge, the grand staircase, but then you come across some personal artifact like a doll uh, or something that you know someone had, like a doll, maybe a, a child's doll or some toy, and everybody on that ship goes real quiet. It's an amazing thing because to me, just beneath this level of science being unemotional, and uh, un dispassionate is this level of passion and emotion that you can just a little tiny poke and it comes out. So yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. Even when you look at uh, an animal at the bottom, you know, for, in my case, looking out the window of the sub and seeing an animal that no one's ever seen before, that's a very powerful thing. It's what an incredible privilege to be the person that laid eyes on that animal for the first time. So, you know, it's, it's, it's more than just science. It's, it's all the emotion of exploration and understanding. Thanks, that's a great question. All right, um, I'm Isaac Carlos from the West Campus. Um, I have two questions actually. My first one was that, um, what's the like, the deepest you can go in a submarine? Yep. And uh, my second would be, um, since you're saying that the earth is heating, is it possible for uh, all the water to flood land? Yep, uh, the, the first part, uh, Jim Cameron, so he made you know, he made a bunch of movies, he's a filmmaker, so he made uh, True Lies and Terminator and Aliens and then Titanic and then Avatar. But his, the reason he does that is to make money to, to support his exploration habit of the ocean. And he's always had that. And he, so he built his own submarine. And uh, it's about that wide across the, the little capsule he sat in. And then, so he went down to the full depth, seven miles in, in the ocean. So that's about as deep as the ocean gets. And when you see a plane, in fact, or a couple of them earlier with a vapor trail out the back, that's seven miles. So that's as deep as the ocean gets, seven miles. And it's, I'm sorry, the second part, oh, the water. I mean, that's a great question. So if, you, if the earth heats up, you melt all the ice, what happens to sea level? And we don't know yet. It's something as simple as that because it's not that simple because if you heat, ice, you melt ice, but you also make humidity, which makes clouds, which makes it rain or snow. So, so maybe it snows someplace else, so it may not just work so simply. But it's one of the biggest questions we have to ask today. That's a great question. Go right there. Um, my name is Marcus Patterson from Martin Luther King Early College. Okay, so I'm going to sound kind of crazy when I ask this, but I kind of have an open mind and I'm open to I come to from a world of crazy, things. so we like crazy. Go so, ahead. I see all these documentaries on like mermaids. Yeah. And like, I mean, 
Uh, do you believe that there is a, <laughs> I don't want to say a mermaid, nah. but like a humanoid mammal species okay. in, in the ocean? Well, here's the deal. <laughs> now, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Uh, I would say no, I would, but I don't like to say never could happen because every time we say never, it happens, right? There's no evidence for that right now, but there's a lot more ocean to explore. Uh, it's, it's, I don't even want to say it's unlikely. You just don't know. There's no evidence for it, for it to uh, happen. And I don't know why Discovery Channel did that. Like the Bigfoot thing, this guy that says he shot Bigfoot, uh, it's in the news all over the place now. He's going to be touring the body around. I don't think that happened, but you know, so uh, anyway, I, you never know what's, some of the, who could believe that an octopus could do that that we saw up there, right? But the idea of a humanoid living, you know, we're, we're doing some work on Atlantis, the story, the true Atlantis, study of Atlantis. And, uh, and one of the things people have in their mind that there's still people living there. So we're good with the idea of a civilization that disappeared. But when we get to the idea that there are people still living there, then it gets a little flaky. And so. I have a more practical question. Um, yeah. when, you're talking, when you were talking about the sonar testing, I heard that that was killing like, a lot of like, mammal species. Yep. How do you, how do you, what's your perspective on yeah, that? Yeah, we, we have to be, you know, some of the studies, we're, we're really careful about that, about whether, when we make sound in the sea or when we use light in the sea, you know, here we are showing up in this unknown world, and the first thing we do is turn on the lights and make all sorts of sounds. And so we're looking at that pretty carefully. Um, I don't know much about the whale issue, except it, it's controversial. Uh, the scientists I know say they don't see much effect of the noise on the whales, but there's gotta be some effect. Um, and this is, one of the, this is why it's important to mobilize the public to saying, you know, without understanding, how can we take action? We need to know, and the answers are there, we need to take the time to know so we can make decisions that are based on fact. You know, we can love this earth to death and we don't want to do that. So that's another great question. Let's go here. Brent from Prepper Academy. Hey, I was just wondering if you could elaborate on how a uh, body of water can be inside of water. <laughs> ah, that's the same question that went through the minds of everybody in the submarine. And I, you know, when they first came across the water on the bottom, uh, lakes at the bottom, and the lakes are like a mile across, 10 miles long, 300 feet deep. Uh, they weren't exactly going through scientific uh, formulas. There, there were just like, you know, a lot of expletives inside. They're saying, how can this be? You know, we're looking at a water down here. It's super salty. So if you pour, like if you, are, if you have coffee and you pour cold cream into coffee, into a hot cup of coffee, it'll go right to the bottom. So what's happening on Earth is you've got the Arctic Ocean and the Antarctic that are really cold water. And if you mix that with the warm water in the, around the equators, it goes to the bottom. And that's where you make, uh, you make uh, water, underwater rivers and waterfalls. But in some places it puddles, and that's how you make those places. But we don't know why it's so crisp like that. It makes no sense to anybody. And there's animals that live in there that don't live in the ocean. There's animals that live in the ocean that don't go into those lakes. So, you know, we don't know until we get out there. It's up to you guys to uh, take up that challenge. You know, in a way, we feel like in my generation, we did our part. Now we've got to get you guys inspired and ladies, so you guys take up where we left off and keep going with this. Um, my name is Micah from Strive Prep, and I was just wondering if, if even if Denver just made a change to, like, stop polluting as much and stop putting all the plastic in the ocean and everything, how would that affect just even if we just started? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I think there's the one thing about your own contribution to making sure that you manage the water, you value your water, uh, that you, what you put in the rivers and streams doesn't make its way to the ocean. That's a huge example. And if Denver can do it, if you can be a leader of it, that's huge because it almost embarrasses the other cities into following suit. So, you know, if it starts here about the ocean a long way from the beach, uh, that's going to have a huge, huge impact. Really huge. My name is Efren De La Rosa, and I'm from North High School. Evan. And I wanted to ask about that long mountain range you said was under the ocean. Yeah. Is that the same thing as a coral reef, or is that no. two different things? Two different things. Uh, coral reefs are awesome, and you can get mountains made out of coral, and you can even get islands that are built on top of coral reefs. This one's much bigger. And it's, I mean, it, it comes up out of the seafloor. So you've seen, you know, the Rocky Mountains just make it like twice as tall and much more steep and make it 50,000 miles long. And, uh, and in the middle, there's a valley and that valley is like three miles deep. And in that valley, there's all sorts of volcanic eruptions and earthquakes and stuff and strange life. So it's a little bit different from the corals. Cor but corals are interesting in their own way. 
uh, you know, because they're, the, they're these little uh, hot, hotbeds of life and all sorts of life, and, and so are the deep oceans. So, you know, if you took away all the water off Earth and looked at the Earth from space, it would be the underwater topography, the coral reefs, the mountain ranges, the valleys that you saw from space that would be most spectacular, more than anything on land. Sorry, my voice is going. Yeah. Um, um, I'm Anne, and I go to John F. Kennedy High School. I am. And I know you're pursuing like your field of interest and you're working where you want to work, yep. but you have to go to kind of like the unknown. You see things that other people don't get to see. And yep. I was wondering if you're like ever afraid. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you, 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 you go through incredible, it's always a safety first rule. So we're always super in, uh, careful about where we go. We're right now planning a trip, an expedition to Antarctica. And uh, it, it takes a lot of care and to, to think about that because we're going to be putting a team of people, men and women, on the ice a long way from any kind of help. So if something goes wrong, you've got to find a way to get them out. And then you've got to find a way to get the, the relief ship out if the relief people get stuck, which just happened. You know, it was just in the news that a Russian ship got stuck and even the ship that came in to help them got stuck too. Uh, things at sea, especially when you're thousands of miles away from any place or a long way from helicopters, um, you can't afford to have things go bad out there. So you want to take every, every care that you can uh, to, to uh, look at the safety issues. Yeah, we're real careful about that. But I, I, don't, I wouldn't say I get scared so much as we think those things through. You know, we, we pay a lot of attention to safety. Yeah. I have to cut it off there. Okay. Dave Gallo, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Fantastic. Fantastic.